Welcome to Soul of Travel Season 2. I'm so excited. This is our first episode of the season, and this season we're focusing on voices of women in travel. And I am really excited for all of these conversations and blending um, my passions for travel and connecting with amazing and inspiring women. So selfishly, this is just a big treat for me, but I hope that everybody else is going to enjoy this just as much. Um, today, I have Laura Greer, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. I had a joke set up kind of to say that you literally wear so many hats because you have so many things you do, and then you set, arrive in your wall of hats. So um, yeah, well, I would love for you to just talk about <laughs> what um, some of the areas of travel that you play in, photography, writing, and then just a little bit about Indiana Hats, and then we'll get more into that later on in the conversation. Okay, uh, thank you. So yeah, my name is Laura Greer, and I'm a adventure travel photojournalist, and I've been doing photography professionally for 20 years now. I went to commercial photojournalism school at Syracuse, and I have since then uh, started a destination wedding and event photography business. I have been doing travel and tourism um, for different tourism boards and for hotels. Uh, I have also been shooting with National Geographic's artisan catalog around the world, working with artisans who are doing vanishing arts, sort of like these alpaca hats in the bands, um, which is how I got introduced to the Quechua communities in Peru that I work with to make these hats. So, um, and my, I also do large scale art pieces for, for like, commercial real estate buildings and for medical buildings. And um, so I kind of have my hands all over. And as you said, I'm also a, a travel writer. So I was writing regularly for Huffington Post Travel and a few other publications. And now um, because my boyfriend was a travel writer, we usually just kind of pair up and uh, I do the photography and he does most of the writing, but I, I do have that background as a photojournalist. And so um, I'm constantly using all my skill sets, whether it's video, social media, writing, photography, like I'm just a storyteller. So I, I can tell stories on whatever medium I'm happy. I'm, I'm always trying to tell stories in any way that I can. <laughs> I love that too. And I love kind of like me, I feel like I also have all these different things I pull from and it doesn't necessarily seem like it would make sense, but in the end, like everything comes together and we have all these unique things that really make what we do different because we have so many different layers to what we love and how we bring that all together. Um, that's definitely, I think one of the things when we first connected that I loved is that I can kind of recognize that in someone else where they are very just like, we really want to learn about everything and then somehow end up folding that into who we are and what we put out into the world. And I just think that makes for really interesting connections. So I love that. Um, so I would love to talk about a little bit about what got you into the travel industry. And I know that you um, travel a lot as a child. And so travel wasn't something necessarily that was new to you, but what, what led you on that path to make that what you wanted to do? Um, God, I should show you my first passport. I still have it over there. I'm like a little baby being like held up in front of the camera. Um, and it's a diplomatic passport too. So both my parents were CIA and we were stationed all over the world when I was younger. So I think um, honestly, being around other cultures and languages. I think at some point I spoke Bahasa when I was a baby. I don't remember it. I do remember certain words, but um, I, I think it really shapes who you are as a person and how like open-minded and how much you care about like leaving your cocoon and your bubble. And so I have three older sisters and all of us are very well-traveled and worldly. Like two of my sisters have been living in Europe for 20 years and speak seven languages fluently. And so I'm sort of like the artist black sheep of the family, but um, I, you know, I, instead of the language skills, I, I have more of like the art skills and, and have been exploring the world in different ways. But um, yeah, it's just been kind of ingrained in me since a young age. And it was actually my mom who gave me the idea about photography because I always wanted to be like a marine biologist or a zoologist or archeologist. I, I just saw, you know, these great adventures like Jacques Cousteau and, um, I wanted to be like them. And then my mom was like, well, I don't know if I see you being like in a laboratory for like hours on end. Like, what if you were the photographer that followed around some of these scientists? And 
Um, Cause I was a kid from a young age, I could never sit still. And so I, you know, that was the first time I even like thought about photography as a career or even going to school for it. Um, and I had never even really done anything with it before I went to college. Like I never took classes in high school or anything. So I pretty much learned everything in college and then fell in love with it. But yeah, it was always a tool for adventure. It wasn't like my calling was always like going on adventures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I feel, um, for me, travel is a tool for exploring the world and connecting with other cultures. And so it's, um, when I started Lotus Sojourns, I kept saying, I, I don't want to start a travel company. I just want travel to be the gateway to these experiences. And I kept trying to steer away from that word, but in reality, it is what I'm doing, but it's just, it's just a component of it. So I love that idea of, um, the photography kind of just being that tool for actually continuing your adventures. Um, and then in the industry, since we're talking about voices of women, I would really love your perspective on, and again, you have a little bit different of perspective because you grew up traveling, but mm. have you had experiences where as a woman traveler, you feel like you've had a different experience, um, yeah. positive and negative. I know I've had both where, um, that's really been different. And in the industry as a photographer and as, as an explorer, you, there's not very many women explorers. So I mean, there actually hear. are, they just aren't voiced as often. Um, yes. you should look up. <laughs> there's so many, um, there's a, there's a chick called Aloha Wanderwell. Look her up. She's freaking <laughs> amazing back from like the early 1900s. I mean, and was traveling the world, um, and doing really outrageous stuff. I'm kind of actually jealous of her life. Um, ended up with like a tribe and, in, in Brazil, but I, that's a long, wow. There's so many ways I can answer this. Okay. I'll start with the photography portion first. When I first started photography, it was definitely a boys club. It still is a boys club. Um, I've been represented by Canon a lot. And, um, most of the explorers of light that I represented by Canon are men. Um, they even did a whole article about it and for, you know, I, they had Nikon gotten a lot of trouble for posting like hundred best photographers and they were like all men. And, um, Luck, when I first started in the wedding industry, it was all men to the point where if I would be shooting, someone would ask me, oh, whose assistant are you? Um, and it's very different now in the wedding industry because when things turned digital um, and things turned into blogging and social media, women are inherently just better at that and connecting and better at like, you know, connecting with the client, um, especially with a bride. So I think that women photographers have like definitely in a lot of ways taken over in the wedding industry in, in my 20 years of doing it. So it's been awesome to see that. I feel like we leveled the playing field, but in many other types of photography, that is not the case. And I, I was actually on a podcast the other day and I was the only woman amongst a bunch of men when they were asking photographers, like professional photographers tips and stuff. And I was really proud to be like the one woman on the panel, but I just think that we're highly underrepresented and um. I don't know why, because there's a lot of female professional photographers. But in terms of travel, I think that I've, I've never been scared being a woman by myself. I've had some pretty gnarly situations, like when I was in India with my girlfriends, where we were like getting grabbed and touched and things like that. But we were also like in the middle of the Holy Festival photographing, where, you know, if we'd done our research, women pr like practice holy behind closed doors at home, and only the men go out in the streets and do it. So we were kind of like, going against their cultural traditions to be out there photographing it. So, you know, at first it was annoying and then we're like, well, we're, you know, not that we're asking for it, but you have to pay attention to cultural traditions and, and realize that, you know, you might not get a great reaction, um, you know, if you throw yourself in a situation where women normally aren't there. But I will say this though, having a camera has given me a passport into really uncomfortable situations for some reason if i'm because i'm like a professional photographer people respect that like men respect that they want i don't know if it's like they want their story to be told so badly or their picture be taken that they're willing to kind of like let their ideas of women go for a second to like have and invite me in i've i've been in a situation where i was in senegal where you know um we were photographing the elders of this village trying to allow girls to be educated like muslim girls and to the point where they greeted every man and wouldn't shake my hand because I was a woman. Um, but they did allow me into their house and into their meeting and, and allow me to photograph them. And that was a big deal. Like as a woman, like no woman's ever allowed to go in there and do that. And so I think because I had a camera, it, it sort of gave me this permission. And so I feel like 
maybe I have had this force field around me because all the times I have my camera, it's like giving me this added protection as a woman that I, I wouldn't normally have. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I will say it has allowed me into uncomfortable situations to feel like I have a, a reason to be there. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that as well. I feel like when I have my camera, it gives me permission like some sense of authority when I'm traveling, like, oh no, I'm taking a picture. I can be here. Otherwise I would feel like I'm invading or disrespecting, but some, there's something about honoring through photography that allows you just a different way of showing up in a space. I also would love to go back to what you said about there being so many women explorers and that we just don't know about them. And that that's exactly why I wanted to do this because I, I know there are so many women out there that are in the travel industry, that are adventuring, that are, I mean, just across the board who are doing great things. And I, I just want to bring those voices together from all around the world to just show what we are doing and I, I think that is really important. I was listening to a podcast a little while ago and a woman was also mentioning an early female explorer and I had never heard of her. And um, this is something as a child that I realized now, I realize I was always meant to do this. I was thinking about this before we were talking today and why, why am I wanting to amplify the voices of women and bring them together and bring it to light? And I remember being issued a book report um, in middle school or high school about World War I. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna write a paper about women's role in World War I. And I went to the library all excited to get my books and they took me to the history section and it's like this big. And then they took me to the section about, you know, World War One. And then they took me to the one book that had like five pages about what women did in World War One. And I think it just sparked that thing in me. And I was just like, no, this can't be true. And then the next year it was like, do the book report on World War Two. And I'm like, well, I'm doing the role of women on, in, you know, World War Two, And it just, it went like that all through college. I remember doing one on women in the media and it just kept going and kept going. And I just kept finding this underrepresentation. And so it really makes sense today that that's what yeah. I want to do is just shine a light on all these incredible women that I know. So thank you for being the first person that I get to. Yeah, I'm so honored with. to be the first person. It's kind of a sad that this year, 2020, what well, marks the hundredth year of, you know, suffer women's suffrage. And um, National Geographic finally was honoring women for the first time in terms of like, I mean, they've honored women before, but they were really like dedicating the whole year 2020. Um, all their exhibits were, you know, like Jane Goodall and based on like female explorers. And they even did an entire issue. Like it was like last November, completely made by women. Like all the photographers in the issue, all the editors, all the writers, everyone, all the subject matter was all women. And it was the first time in hundred years National Geographic had done that. And then like everything shut down, like literally the entire museum and headquarters and everything has shut down for 2020. And it just sucks because it was like slated to be this epic year of celebrating women. And I hope they continue to do that next year. But there's been many female explorers. It's just that history is mostly written by men. And, um, and I have nothing against men. I'm just saying that like, right. you know, history is written by storytellers. So the more female storytellers we have, the more we'll show up in history. And so we just, you know, we've got to just speak our minds and, and get out there and tell our stories. And that's the only way we'll be represented more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would also now like to talk about, this is the story when I first heard you talking, how you, the journey of Andy Ann Hats. And I love that it was a journey because journeys are my favorite thing, but I love that it, it takes all of these pieces of where you've been and who you have been and who you're becoming and like rolls it into this unique thing. But as you're walking through the mountains of Peru, which Peru is also my happy place. And um, I would just love for you to share with our listeners what that journey was and how it came to be. Well, we were, and we is my business partner, Pat, she lives in Peru and well, we had become friends over the years of me traveling down there and she was working for Delphine Amazon Cruises and they were partnering with land lodges and different, um, you know, so I was, I would go down there to shoot for National Geographic, but then I would also like stay and do a shoot for her company. So we were on assignment to go find the highest altitude land lodge 
in the world and it was called Andean Lodges and you have to hike through the Rainbow Mountains, also in Gate Trek it's called, and like you hike eight hours a day to one lodge and the next day you hike eight hours to the next lodge and the next lodge. So there's like five lodges and um, you're getting up to like 17,000 feet elevation at points and it's really, really the hardest thing I've ever done in my life and we weren't prepared for it at all. Like we're like, oh, we're just gonna like hike through, like how hard could this be? And um, but you know, before I went on this journey, I had been to Peru many, many times. Um, I, altitude doesn't usually bother me that much. And I've always been obsessed with hats. Before I had this giant hat wall and started this company, I was always wearing hats like Indiana Jones. And um, that was always like my thing. Um, and so as we were hiking on this trek, it was like, you know, deprived of oxygen. We're like hiking over, you know, like mountain peak after mountain peak in the snow, walking sticks. We had llamas carrying our gear. Like it was like a legit hiking situation. We started with seven people and only three completed it. So it was like a, not an easy hike at all. And um, we kept on hiking through these amazing villages along the way. And everyone in Peru in the Andes Mountains, like hats are a very big part of their culture. And they, they tell you what village you're from and how important you are in the village. And if you're married or single and like a hat is like a status symbol, but it's also, you know, like protecting you. There's a lot of radiation up there. So um, as we're going to the villages, I was kind of obsessed with all the different hats I was seeing and the really incredible styles. I was like stopping and taking pictures. And our guide said in Spanish to my girlfriend, like your girlfriend's obsessed with these hats. And she's like, you don't understand. She's like Indiana Jones. And I was like, more like Andiana Jones, you know? Cause like we're a little like deprived of oxygen or whatever. And then we both, she like kind of rolled her eyes and we both stopped and we're like, that would be a great name for a hat company. And then I was like, wait a minute we need to start a hat company. And then all of a sudden it like turned into this, you know, the rest of the hours of hiking, we were like brainstorming and like, how could, no, we could actually do this. Like you live in Peru, I live in LA, you know, we work with Nat Geo, they have access to the artisans, like we could do this. And um, by the end of the hike, we were like, you know, we like went down to the village in Oyantai Tambo at like five days later, we like bought the domain name and we like sat in there on like our laptops. Like they had no idea like what to think of us. We're in this like ancient Inca town, like trying to trademark it and like buy the name and set up like a Squarespace site. And we were um, really excited about it. And it was funny because when you're in the sacred Valley, they're so connected to like the cosmos and mother nature and just Pachamama, they call her. And um, that day, cause my business partner and I are both Pisces. I don't know if I told you this part of the story we decided to check our horoscope. It was like the day we started this trek. And she sent me our joint horoscope and it said, there's a, a lunar eclipse. We were like hiking on the lunar eclipse. There's a lunar eclipse today and today's a really special day. Um, you're gonna come up with a business idea that's gonna change your life, blah, blah, blah. And I remember both of us being like, how's that gonna happen? We're going on this hike and, and then that happened and we looked back and we're like, oh my God, our horoscope completely came true. And, um, but yeah, that's what it said that day. Like today is going to change your life. You're going to come up with this idea and it's, it's, you know, going to be like, like all this stuff. And, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, my life has definitely forever been changed from starting this hat company. Oh, I love that so much. Um, I'm also a Pisces, so I definitely didn't oh, hear really? that part of the story oh before. <laughs> I, it's um, really funny. I, I have a lot of friends that are Pisces. Uh, I, I love that so much because I, I know that's how we initially connected is when I travel, artisans are who I always want to meet. And I love that your hat company helps to sustain culture that is being lost in a lot of areas because it's difficult, it's challenging, it takes a lot of time to create the products. A lot of the products are undervalued because in order to be paid what they're worth, they're really expensive. Um, and people are moving from villages to cities. And I think it's so important um, in the United States, around the world, that especially the indig indigenous cultures and their crafts are celebrated and honored because it tells the story of the people and the land and the country. And for me, it it's just such, such an instant connection to where I am when I meet with artisans. Um, and then usually I gravitate toward connecting with women. And so then I'm also getting to connect with women around the world, which again, as we know, is my favorite thing. Um, and it, it's just this beautiful way of embracing where you are. So I really love that that is what kind of came out of that. It's a company, but it really embraces culture and connection and heritage and offers more than just a product. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about the artisans and the story of the bands and things like that? Yeah, it's funny you keep on saying the word connection. That's actually the meaning of the band I'm wearing. So, I think that's uh, the one I've been wanting. So there's... Really, that makes sense. So, um, <laughs> so what's special about the hats? They're all hand-shaped alpaca wool um, and hand-dyed, naturally dyed. But the bands themselves are really special because they're woven and with different Quechua meanings. So the one I'm wearing is actually the... Um, the imagery is the, are the branches of the tree of life. And so they believe that the tree of life connects the three realms of spirituality. Like the branches go into heaven, the trunk is um, grounded on earth, and then the roots go into the underworld. So that the tree of life connects all, you know, dimensions and past, present, future, and connects your spirituality realms. And, and so it's a really powerful, I, I, per, I, chose that today because that's sort of like I am feeling like I need more connection right now in my life and I usually get that feeling by traveling and you know since I'm not traveling as much it's like I'm feeling like I need that but all of our bands have different patterns and different meanings in Quechua their language is actually a woven and an oral language it's not a written language it's a, the ancient Inca language they still speak it to today like up there today um, so all the bands have different meanings. Like this one is actually protection or good luck. It's the evil eye pattern. Mm -hmm. um, every ancient culture has some form of the evil eye pattern, which is really interesting. It's sort of like guards your third eye and wards off uh, bad energy. And they really believe that like the hat is not just a status symbol. It is covering your third eye chakra. It's covering your crown chakra, which is the closest chakra to like being connected to the greater energy and the you know universal energy. So it's very powerful and it's, you know, not only guards your energy, but it also like puts out energy. So our idea was having what we call intention bands where you choose what intention you want to wear and you put it around your hat. So not only are we, you know, buying these weavings from these women that are, they're still using the ancient backstrap looms and they're still doing the weaving designs and traditions that they have done since Inca times. Um, so we're allowing them to continue that vanishing craft and also continue their language because it's, you know, it's a vanishing language and culture as well. And then um, then they're beautiful and you're allowing the the wearer to have a choice and to have an intention. You just pull this off and put another one on. So if I want to have my good luck intention or this one's abundance or we have love or resilience, we, you know, purpose, we keep on adding new intention bands to our library. And that's probably my favorite part of the whole process of this business is like, choosing a new band and like discussing with the women the meaning of it and like figuring out the name in Quechua and like writing the meaning of a, about like the intention itself. It's one of my favorite things to do. But um, yeah, we, we knew that we wanted, we're like, oh my God, it's like so much trouble. Like it's a, like kind of a logistical nightmare to get these hats from indigenous people to the US. It's not, you know, when someone goes on our website and clicks, you know, we have to have them here first to ship them out. Um, and so the process to get them from the villages to here is a lengthy, complicated process that involves like, we have to email a nonprofit and someone has to hike up with a Quechua translator and place the order and like, it's like a whole thing. So, um, but it's amazing because these women can work from home and before a lot of them had to hike eight hours to a nearby village and just sell like a couple rolls of of weavings and um, they're away from their families, they're away from their homes, they're not making that much money. Now they can just be home, not disrupt their life, but work when, around their farming schedule, around their kids' schedule, and they're making a lot more money than even their husbands. A lot of their husbands have quit their jobs to stay home and take care of the animals and, and, um, and the women are the breadwinners. And so now their daughters, because the weaving is passed down through the women. The, now the daughter's like, I want to be a weaver like my mom. Where before, like you said, a lot of them were wanting to go into the cities and not be living um, like in the ancient ways up in the mountains. So when you give someone sustainable income opportunities um, or hope or something to aspire to, then then they will continue to be able to do what they're doing. So that's kind of the idea between uh, behind National Geographic is like they're representing artisans around the world doing these things and giving them this global marketplace and online, you know, e-commerce resource. It's like ironic because technology is ending a lot of these cultures, but technology is also like saving these cultural mm -hmm. practices through online catalogs and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so it's, it's really amazing. Um, we wanted to have something special about the hats. So we wanted to like harness the energy of the sacred Valley somehow. And so the intention bands were like the perfect way to make them unique and recognizable and energetic, you know, like, they're, it's just awesome. It's like we say that you can look good, do uh, look good, feel good, and do good at the same time. So that's kind of like our our tagline. 
I just want to pause and there's so many amazing things that I wish I could dive into for like hours of conversation <laughs> right there. But um, I, I mean, I fully believe in supporting artisans and, and what that impact is for women and communities. And I've been involved in working with fair trade artisans and really have seen what that brings to their lives and to their children's lives and what that offers. And it really is life-changing. And I know sometimes it sounds trite to say that, but it, it offers so much more. And if, if you haven't had the opportunity to travel and connect, you, you don't really understand what something, how powerful of an impact it can make but allowing their children to go to school, allowing them fresh drinking water, allowing them to be empowered and be able to, ha to have money, which gives them status and, and really changes the trajectory of their lives. And so I, I really celebrate that, um, that part of your work. And, and I think that's the story that's so important. And I love bridging storytelling with the hats because um, people really connect to that then and it makes it important. It, it's not just a hat. And um, again, like they might get that band and they have no idea what Quechua is or where it's from or what that means. And then you've just created awareness for someone and it, it's such a, an accessible way to do it. Um, and that really it reminds me too of also this morning, I was thinking about why Peru, like, why did I have this kind of itch that I had to go there? And I remembered, and you can't really see, I bought this necklace when Is I was that in the high school. that you get at Machu Picchu? Yeah. Well, I bought it when I was in high school in Seattle. I went to, um, in the Pikes Market, they have all the little vendors and it feels like you're traveling all around the world, kind of in the basement of Pikes Market. And I bought this and I remember it had a little tag that said made in Peru. And I grew up in a rural Montana and I, I knew, knew ish where Peru, what Peru was and I didn't really know anything about it and kind of started researching and then I learned about Machu Picchu and it was just in my mind I'm like I absolutely am going there and another funny story about that is when I was really little I don't know if you remember the cartoon DuckTales oh, yeah, <laughs> I watched all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but they traveled all over the world right in their adventures and I just remember thinking like I wonder if any of these places are real, but they're so mystical, they couldn't be. And I remember they had gone to Machu Picchu. And then I saw pictures when I was learning about Peru from my necklace. And I just, I was like, it is real. Like that's kind of my dots that connected that were like, there are things like this in the world. <laughs> and so I'm like, I am going. DuckTales got me to Machu Picchu. <laughs> but when I was there, the energy is also something that's hard to convey like the whole country period but the ruins and those architectural sites and sitting and sharing space with people on the land it's like it takes your breath away it's like i feel like for me like my soul lands at home like i just feel like i'm really living and a part of the world and and it's that connection that that you know you were saying you're missing um, and so I, I just love that again, like you have all these hats <laughs> that come together into this brand that really, um, honor all those different things. So I, I just am so excited to be aware of the work that you're doing and to share that with people that haven't heard of you and, and what you are doing right now. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you said that really really well and that was really sweet i i also wanted like it's funny because my sisters are in business and they're like half the time don't understand what i do and they're like well you're just like selling the hats and making a lot of money off these people and i was like no no no, no. she asked me a question like what how much of that goes back to the women and i was like oh, okay i need to clarify this this isn't a charity like we actually you can do you can have a for-profit business that is helps everyone and everyone benefits from it and so literally we're starting like an actual enterprise with these women um the nonprofit that we work with awamaki helps bridge um companies like myself with these women that do weaving so i'm, I'm actually not the only um company that's working with them i think lauren conrad's little market also has woven baby goods that um come from there and 
So they get all of these jobs that Awamaki helps like bridge companies like that and connect access because they're the ones that are in the Sacred Valley and have to hike out and place the orders and stuff like that. And because they're all part of fair trade, they set their own prices. And a lot of these women had never even used currency before. Like they're all in like a barter system, they live off the land. And so that was um, a lot of the programs that Awamaki works with with the women is having them set worth to what they do and set a price to it and be able to be confident about it and to be able to ask for that and be able to accept money and do business in exchange because we're kind of training them to be entrepreneurs themselves. Like they don't just work for us. Like they were in partnership with them. So they do this for a lot of other uh, businesses. And um, we're also sharing the work amongst many um, women. So in fact, like if you look at my, I'll show you this. Like our connection bands, like no two, no two bands are the same. If you like look at the one on my hat, like they're all very different because we have like a hundred and something different women weaving all of these. So they're never going to be the same. Um, and so we're working with like a lot of different communities. Uh, well, Maki spreads all the work and the love, like, you know, so everyone gets like a lot of like work and, um, and they set their price and we're paying them a lot more than like if we went to a random market and like paid a weaver. Um, and we're okay with that because we know that it's paying into healthcare, it's paying into programs like confidence building and quality control. And it's paying into like these women, like learning to be entrepreneurs. And so I just, I want people to understand that like, this isn't like, Oh, 5% of the proceeds go back to the women. Like they get paid first. And then it's our responsibility to somehow get these hats from like the Sacred Valley from Peru to the US through customs, like all that stuff and sell it. And, you know, all of that has like a lot of cost, uh, you know, added to it. Like most of the cost of the hat is like logistics, honestly. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I had to explain that to my sister because I think people don't understand the difference between like a charitable company or a nonprofit versus a for-profit company. And you can do for profit and still do good. Like everyone benefits from it. Right. Uh, I love that model so much. And again, as I mentioned, I, I have worked in that space and it is a very, it's a difficult conversation because that's the thing that people understand is, oh, what percentage goes back? And, and all, I get asked that question over and over and over again. And I love because I work in the fair trade model, which is similar to what Awakami is, is like the women set the price. They say, this is what I need to earn. And that's the difference is that if they went and sold those same bands on a, the market in Peru, they're going to make so much less. They're at a disadvantage about what they can get paid for. And again, like you said, they, they might have to hike days to get to where they can sell it. And so there's so much value in teaching them this and then the business skills as well. And I was just in Guatemala a year ago, almost exactly. And um, I met this woman who had started as um, a weaver in an artisan cooperative there. And then she was taking um, some of their programs in how to become a businesswoman. And now she does embroidery and weaving and she does these bracelets for this company that I'm connected with. And she also has like 15 other women that she's training and they all have their own businesses. And then she is opening a store in their small town where these women can all come and sell the goods that they've created out of their own businesses. So it, it really ripples out quickly. And to hear her talk about everything she's done, it's, it's just so incredible. And so again, like I just honor this work. It's my, it's my favorite thing because it just feels so impactful and real and again, preserves heritage and culture and connection. And so um, I, I understand how difficult it can be. And I celebrate you for working your way through those conversations because I know it can be hard. Um, I would like to go back to a little bit more about travel. And I was wondering if you might share one of your most I guess, transformational travel experiences, if you would be opening, what I love about travel is that it, it, it takes you to a different place, obviously, but when we get there, we show up differently, I feel, because you lose all the constraints of who you need to be wherever you live in your day-to-day -day life. And when you're in that space, then 
this kind of magic happens. And I feel like I always, I learn a lesson. I'm given a gift by a trip or um, something really powerful happens when you open the door to that. And so there's that part. And then I also know that you had this moment where for travel, you traveled so much for work that travel was kind of about work. And then you had this awareness that you really want to travel to be meaningful and more intentional. So I don't know if there's something that blends those two thoughts together, but I'll hand the ball to your court. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think that transformational travel, which was like a super catch word, like two years ago, you know, there was like experiential travel and then transformational travel. Um, when I turned 40 last year, I was approaching 40. I, you know, I start, you start looking at life. I look at life in sections of like ex-boyfriends <laughs> and decades. I don't know about you, but like, like, I feel like ex-boyfriends like represent different sections of my life. Yeah. Um, but so do decades. And like, I, I'm actually friends with Ricky Lake. It's funny. And she, when she turned, she's like a 10 years older than me. When she turned 50, she did this really cool exercise where she sat down one day and wrote down everything that stood out to her as like, of like momentous in her forties. And she's like, when I turned 40, I did the same thing. I wrote everything that was important to me or that stood out that I felt was like an, you know, like an important thing that happened during that decade. And I was like, Ooh, I'm going to like do that. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write down everything in my thirties. And I realized that most of my thirties was, um, I mean, really fun. I've had like great, I don't look back at anything. There's no regrets, but I do feel like I focus a lot on work and, um, and your 20s are like hustling and just trying to survive. And your 30s are like trying to be a boss lady, you know? And then 40, I was like, okay, so I've done a lot of these things and I can continue to do these things, but like, I can like also do better. Like I could do more, like I could still travel and do all these things, but like help or do good. Like a lot of people are like, oh, one day when I'm older and I have more money, I'll volunteer. And you're like, no, 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 no. Like you don't need to wait to do good. Like, you know, to be honest, most of the volunteers out there are people that are dirt poor and like, dedicate their life to it. Like, so I just started thinking about how I wanted to, you know, think bigger than myself. So I wanted my forties to be about thinking larger and like anyone who's ever become like a millionaire or ever like changed the world, like had an idea that was way bigger than themselves and that they couldn't do alone. Like they had to do with a lot of people. And so I started thinking like, okay, everything I've done up to this point, I did alone. I now want to think like larger than that. So, and, and even with just my travels, I started doing my um, workshops and I would build in like philanthropic things into the fee of the workshop. Like, oh, like everyone who joins is going to benefit this person or this village or whatever. And I realized that people inherently want to do good. They just don't want to see the price tag for it. Like if you said, hey, would you donate $700 to like help this orphan out? Most people are going to be like, that's a lot of money. But if you just say, hey, um, it's going to be $3,500 for this amazing trip, like all included, blah, blah, blah. And you'll also be like part of the fee is, you know, helping this girl for like a year. Everyone's like, yeah, sign me up. But you know, you just have to build it in. I don't know why, but I just, be, I just realized that there's like a psyche to, to philanthropy. And so I'm, it all started for me at a really transformational year. Like right before 40, I was going through like a bad breakup. I had a major knee surgery where I couldn't get on planes. I did like, couldn't walk. I was on crutches for, you know, six weeks and I wasn't able to travel or work during that time. And I remember sitting there being like, I'm going to dread this. Like I'm never still, I can't ever sit still, you know? And I was really um, at first dreading the six weeks. And then I changed my perspective and was like, I'm going to sit, really take this time to like play music, to have good conversations with friends, to like really itemize, like, you know, write out what I want to do and like have a life plan. And, um, and I loved those six weeks. It was sort of like the universe gave me that time that I would have never given myself. And that was how I got involved with travel with meaning and everything. I just started Googling literally travel and social good, travel with meaning. And I, there's all these amazing groups out there, like travel groups. And one was called travel and social good. And the other was called travel with meaning. And both of the leaders of those groups lived walking distance from me in Venice beach. And I had no idea and so I ended up connecting while I was on crutches with like all these amazing travelers and adventurers and a lot of them live nearby. And that, that's how a lot of this started. I started thinking like, I want to have an intention behind what I do. And shortly, literally right after that was when the hats and the intention bands and everything happened. And it was just like, I think my mind shifted and it was like, I could have started this business years ago. I've been traveling to Peru for 12 years 
I've always loved hats. I've had the ability to do this. It just, my mindset wasn't there yet, you know? So I think once I decided I wanted to think larger than myself and be more intentional was when like all of this happened and all of these awesome other people I was meeting that are out there doing good work too. And so it was just like shifting my, my perspective, I guess. Mm -hmm. That was my transformational thing, my knee surgery, honestly. Yeah. (laughs) It's funny how, I mean, that's how things happen. I, I mean, obviously this whole year is that moment of pause for a lot of people and Um, that led me to start solo travel, which I never would have done. And I'm so grateful. Like, of course I would have rather have gone to like Peru and Guatemala and Australia and all these places that I was going this year. Um, but the value I think that's coming out of this, that's beyond my value is really important. And I just wouldn't have attempted to do this if I was still moving around. So this year is really, um, transformational for everyone. And I don't, I don't think people realize it. And I mean, I'm learning this too, that you have to slow down and feel uncomfortable before you can like change and grow. You just have to, you know, I, I'm constantly going at fast speed and like, you don't grow when you're like at that level all the time. And this one guy I actually met him on, like in the Caribbean. And he told me this analogy that I always remember. And that's what I feel like 2020 is. He said the Eagles, like the bird, um, actually can live to be like 75 or 80 years old, but when they turn like right around 40, right around my age, um, they, their talons get actually dull and they have to go through and their beaks too. And they don't, they're not as good of a hunter. And so they have to go through this really painful thing where they have to like peck a rock, like really hard and, and reshape their beak and they have to scratch things. And it's like very painful for the bird, but the ones that go through that are the ones that can hunt again and like live a long time the ones that don't go through it'll end up dying young because they didn't go through the pain and the transformation they needed to and I just think that that's such an interesting analogy of just like life like you kind of almost have to go through this hard struggle to I'm excited to see what happens after 2020 like the new business ideas and the innovations and all the things that are going to come out of this weird cocoon that we've been in I think it's going to be insane like I'm I'm excited to see how creative people are, you know, cause people have to get creative right now. I, I agree. I've had this like, um, bubble of optimism that's just been sitting on top of everything. Like I just keep, and because of that, I'm like so many people right now are being put through those extreme challenges and it, it does create something that happens on the other side. And just to have that many people at the same time going through the same process, um, I think yeah. I think it's going to allow for magic, but that's, I don't know if it's just my hope or if it's real, but that's where I'm at with that. And I think in the travel industry too, um, that's something, you know, everybody is obviously really on pause. Travel just had to stop. I think it's one of those industries that was really impacted because literally, unless you're traveling within the United States or within the country that you live in, people have not been traveling. And it, it's such a powerful time for us to look at why were we traveling in the first place? How were we traveling? How were we showing up in the world? What were we giving and what were we taking? And how can we set back out in a different way? And I'm also hopeful and optimistic that this is the time that that more intentional and mindful travel is going to be what surfaces because people are really going to be seeking connection and people are going to, I think, be avoiding, you know, big cities and the more touristed places. And they're really going to be getting out off the beaten path a little bit and slowing down their travel and hopefully going places for longer periods of time. And so all of that's going to alter what travel looks like. And then I think that also will alter what people can expect it to offer them. Um, so I'm, I'm so excited because that's my, that's the way I love to travel. And I'm just hoping that that's what exists. I mean, I think that will be a trend of people having, um, you know, wanting to be more out in nature and not around lots of crowds of people. Um, I think it'll shift some of the tourist spots. Um, I know that right now, like we were trying to find any type of silver lining, like my friends that live in Bali right now are like, 
it's the least amount of trash and crazy crowds we've ever seen here. And I think that island needed a freaking break. Yeah. Like a lot of places were becoming very overly touristed. And as much as the locals, like it sucks because they depend on a lot of that tourism, I think the land needed a break, you know? And so I hope that when they do reintroduce it, that they do it in a way that's um, more sustainable. And, and, you know, I hope that people are like, learning from this but yeah I mean there are a lot of places that were getting a little too crazy and and you know a shift needed to happen anyway um but yeah I mean hopefully this will give like tourism opportunities to other places that weren't getting as much love you know outside of the city so I'm hoping that you know it's, it's even happening here just within the U.S. like I know a lot of people that are doing a mass exodus out of major cities like New York and San Francisco and they're moving to random towns in America or like even Detroit's getting a resurgence um, because it's cheaper because you can work from anywhere now a lot of places people so I think it's going to spread out this like congestion um, now that people can do a lot more remote things and I'm hoping that will be good you know I hope it'll stop a lot of the pollution and the traffic and rate and like lower some of the prices and just kind of correct things a little bit yeah yeah it's like a, yeah a giant course correct for the world <laughs> um <laughs> Well, I would like you to share with our listeners how they can connect with you, how they can learn about travel experiences that you offer, how they can purchase Indiana hats. I know you mentioned you have a whole bunch arriving, so it's going to be exciting for people to be able to go on your website and see what's coming in. Yeah. I'm, um, so Indiana hats, our website, it's spelled A-N-D-E-A-N-A -A -A hats. Um, you can find us on Instagram too. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been, we've had hats kind of stuck down in Peru for many months and they just reopened the borders. So we're super excited because we're getting them up this month, right in time for like the holidays. Um, so you can even buy gift cards online where people can then just, you know, later on purchase their own hat. If you are in the Los Angeles area, we are having a physical holiday pop-up on December 5th out here in Venice Beach. Um, but yeah, we're getting brand new fedora hats, which we haven't had in like a year, um, we're actually doing really cute bags. Like the bags themselves are going to have straps that are okay. woven for the women. And then on the side of the bag, you can like snap your hat into the side of it. So you can like, you know, travel with it. Mm -hmm. And we also have Shikana stones that are going to be brooches that are hand cut Ragonite stones from the Sacred Valley. Um, we are going to have, yeah, a lot of new colors. Uh, we have bucket hats, floppy hats, Western hats. I'm wearing the Spanish style hat. So we, we're going to just like stock up and like, th this is nothing compared to what's arriving. So mm -hmm. it's going to be filled for a ceiling of hats. I'm really excited about it, but um, yeah. And we also do like virtual uh, trying on sessions where I was, I was saying to you earlier, like if you live far away and you can't decide which hat, we could even ship a bunch of hats to you and you can um, ship back the ones that don't fit. So we have options for, for those of you that don't live nearby. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think there'll be a lot of people who will be excited and um, I'm hoping in the future that we're going to have a shared travel experience that we can bring people on and take them to all of these places and connect with women. Um, I'm so happy that we have met because I just, it's one of those things that I think the power of connection, um, it, it really is important and we meet the people we're supposed to meet so we can greaten our impact. And I know that the minute we started talking that that felt like a truth for me. So I'm so excited. Um, I'm yeah, gonna, oh, I want to mention oh, one more thing that on um, Wednesday, October 21st, I'm doing sort of a, an hour and a half uh, storytelling uh, class. I'm going to talk about how to like add more, um, I'll be talking about a lot of travel stories and I'll be doing, um, you know, showing examples and telling people how they can add more intention to their imagery. So if people want to tune into that, just if they follow me on Instagram, like I'll post about the, the master class, but it's, um, it's going to be really fun. That was one of my favorite things is like combining storytelling. Um, I mean, not just with the hats, but even just with the photos, like a lot of people see my photos and they don't know the whole story of what happened behind it. So I'm going to be definitely doing a, a few more storytelling cocktail hours. <laughs> Excellent. I, I love that too, because storytelling is just so important. It's, it's how we grow and change and understand. So I will be looking forward to that. And I will, I'll share that when I'm sharing um, this interview as well. Um, I'm going to play with, um, I love the podcasts that have the rapid fire questions at the end. And I've always wanted to do this. I'm going to feel like oh, yeah. Brene Brown right now. 
because <laughs> she does it in her podcast. Um, I, I just have, I have nine questions, which I guess I should have thought of 10 because nine is weird. But um, the first one is what is your favorite book or movie that offers you a travel escape or inspires you to adventure? Um, the Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Excellent. Uh, what is always in your suitcase? God, um, something colorful and flowy to make my pictures look cuter. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is your favorite destination? I mean, Peru, but if I have to pick a second one, um, I love the Indonesian islands. Um, where do you still long to visit that you haven't been yet? Madagascar. That was my big trip this year that got canceled. Um, what do you eat that immediately connects you to a place you've been? Oh gosh, I would have to just say like chicken satay. It just brings me back to Indonesia. Um, who was the person that inspired or encouraged you to set out and explore the world? Jacques Cousteau and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could take an adventure with one person, fictional or real, alive or who's past, who would it be? All right, Richard Branson. That guy. I mean, I just want to hang out with him at all times. Like, ugh, I hope I get to meet him. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Um, where do you think travel has the most opportunity for positive impact? Oh, gosh. Where do I, I got think heavy. Sorry. Wait, wait, back, say that question one more time. Where like, do you think travel has the most opportunity to create a positive impact? Um, I think that in developing countries, like a lot of third world countries, I think that have beautiful natural resources and, and there's many of them. I think that positive tourism that, you know, people can go visit farms or go work on a farm or do that kind of stuff could really, really help impact those areas. I think, um, you know, getting out of the congested cities is, is a step in the right direction towards that. So I'm hoping that they'll, they'll benefit from tourism soon. And the last one is um, tied to a project I'm working on right now. So this is totally a selfish ask, but I also am super curious. Um, what is one thing that you do when you travel that could create real change in how you show up in your day-to-day -day life if you brought it back? So what's something that you own you know, you allow yourself the space for when you travel, but you don't bring into your real life. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, like having my cell phone not work for a while. Like I go to a lot of places where my phone just doesn't work or, you know, I can't go online. I think allowing myself uh, airplane mode for a certain time every day would be an amazing practice that I need to learn. And there's many times when I'm traveling that I just don't even have my cell phone at all um and i i'm not like that my daily life it's like within arm's reach at all times so i think that i could easily practice that i think having a um and also being awake earlier i find that i get up and kind of like am in mode with like the sun and where i'm at like um a lot more when i'm traveling mm -hmm. than when i'm here so i think i could probably get up earlier and do more in the mornings <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. It totally does. Thank you. Okay. Thank and you reading. I read a lot more when I'm traveling. So you allowing can... myself time to read like an actual oh. book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I constantly wish I just had like a month in a hammock and the piles of books that I have around my house. I've been mm -hmm. better recently, but yes. Um, well, that is everything. Thank you so much. This was so fun. I'm so glad that we were able to do this. And um, anyone who's listening, just make sure you follow Laura Greer on Instagram, Laura Greer Travel, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing what comes your way and our way in the future. Oh my gosh, so much. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.